as the church, and I'm not, I don't specifically mean Little Cypress Baptist Church there. This is a, probably a common thread throughout churches all over the world. We want to set ourselves up as these moral superiors, forgetting that we were once those. Right? Here's the thing. If we can't admit that there is sin in our heart, that there is sin in our lives, what need do we have for a Savior? And I don't know about you, but, but I need a Savior. And I need someone who can obey the law because I can't. I need someone who can do the things that I can't do. And so Paul says this, that they have misunderstood the law. They're misusing the law. See, the law is not the medicine. The law is the diagnostic to let you know that there's a problem, right? Every six months, probably already going to do it a little bit more often, every, at least every six months, uh, I'm required uh, by our insurance uh, and sometimes by my doctor uh, to go and get my blood tested to make sure that everything is the way it ought to be and usually it's never the way it ought to be. Right? Anybody <laughs> feeling me on that one? I mean, just love ice cream, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> Like, we were coming home last night, and Kelly goes, I think I want some ice cream. And I go, yes. And I whipped over into the other lane so I could go to Dairy Queen and get me a dip cone. And she's like, well, I didn't mean that you had to go do it. I said, no, I wanted it. I just wanted validation for, for going. <laughs> I just didn't want to be the only one that, did, that wanted it. And so uh, I go every, every six months to have my blood tested to make sure the cholesterol and the uh, A1C and all that stuff is right. And again, it's usually not right. But just because I go get my blood drawn doesn't mean I'm going to be okay. No, I have to take the medicine, right? All the, the fistful of pills every morning that I've got to take because I like ice cream and other carbohydrates that are just so delicious, right? All you low-carb keto people. Uh, <laughs> give, give me the chips and salsa and I'm good, right? I'm getting my vegetables and my fruit with that, right? Plus tomatoes are fruit, right? <laughs> All that to say, I can go get my blood drawn all day long, but if I don't take that medicine, what's going to happen to me? I'm going to continue down the road, worse than I already am, of not taking care of my health. And then I'm going to die at an early age, and Kelly's going to be mad and bitter at me, uh, because then she's stuck with Jack, and he um, likes me more. Um, <laughs> right? Um, but the point is this. We can focus on the law all day long, but until we take the medicine, until we realize I need a Savior and the Savior is Jesus, then we're just preaching something and we're laying a weight on someone that, we, that they were never meant to bear. And that's what Jesus is saying through, um, through the Sermon on the Mount. He's saying these Pharisees, go, go back and, and look very briefly uh, in Matthew uh, chapter 5. This isn't in my notes, and so I, I might get in trouble. Mark, we ask him for forgiveness, right? Um, not permission. Uh, in, back in, in, in Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus is talking about how uh, he has come to fulfill the law, he says, um, for, in verse 20, he says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus isn't saying, hey, keep the law better than these guys. Because if you fast forward to Matthew chapter 23, what does Jesus say about their righteousness? That it's fake. That, it's, that they're like empty tombs. Or they're, they're like tombs. That on the, on the outside, they're, they look good. They're nice. They're white. They're pretty. But on the inside, where, where, what is there? There's, there's death and there's decay. They're, they're like the cup that the outside's been cleaned. And so it looks good. But on the inside, it's filthy. I mean, anybody want to drink out of a dirty, dirty cup, right? Sometimes my dishwasher doesn't get it quite as clean as it ought to. And so I'm excited. I'm fixing, a, fixing me a cup of coffee in the morning because... Hashtag coffee is life, right? Um, and so I'm fixing to fix it. And, and I look as I'm putting my sweet low in there because I'm just not man enough to drink straight black coffee. and have a little sweetness in there. Uh, and so I go to put my sweet low in there and I realize there is just nastiness all in that cup. Well, who's going to drink out of that cup? Sometimes if you're desperate enough, you do it, right? I don't really do that. You're like, He's not. I don't really do that. But, but Jesus isn't saying, hey, be, be a little bit more righteous than them. Jesus is saying they're not righteous. That it's all fake. It's all a show. And so the point of the law is not that you can keep it. The point of the law is that you can't keep it. It is uh, the diagnostic. It is not the medicine. And so church, we must guard against that in our conversations with people. 
As we're sharing our faith, we should never say, look, if you're going to come to a relationship with God, you have to clean up first. You have to obey the law first. The, we, we, can, we can lead in with the, God, the, with the law. I, I'm okay with that. But if the law never leads to the good news that Jesus fulfilled the law on our behalf, then we're misleading people. We're being false teachers ourselves. And so we must be careful and we must guard ourselves individually uh, and, and corporately from proclaiming a gospel that's not really the gospel. That it is a weight, it is a burden on people that they were never meant to keep. We were never meant to jump through hoops in order to get to God. Now, does that mean once we come to God we should be transformed and changed? I think we all know the answer to that. We come to God and He molds and transforms us and shapes us and roots those things out of our lives that should not be there. Those behaviors, those thought patterns that should not be there. We don't have to do that in order to come to God. So we must be careful as we preach the gospel that it is truly the good news that Jesus uh, did what we can never do on our own. And so church, we must guard the gospel. Because if we lose the gospel, we lose everything. So Paul goes on and he says this now. We're almost done. We're like halfway there, right? Verse 12. For I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the love and uh, with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of which of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, uh, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were uh, to believe in him for eternal life. Verse 17, to the king of the ages, mortal, visible, the only God, the honor and glory forever. Ever. Amen. So what Paul does is he moves from his charge to Timothy to guard the gospel. He now begins to celebrate the gospel. See, Paul is remembering that he too was, uh, as he said in verse uh, verses 10 or 9, 9 through 11, that he was lawless and disobedient, ungodly. He was a sinner. He was unholy and profane. Uh, he was one of those who strikes their mothers and fathers. He's a, he was a murderer. He was sexually immoral. Men, who, he, and, and I'm not saying Paul did all of these specific things, but Paul lumps himself into that category. He even says it in verse 15, of whom I am the foremost, where I am the chief of sinners. Now, no, Paul doesn't say, and I, I just want us to, to, to draw this point out very, very briefly. Paul doesn't say, I was the chief of sinners. Paul says, I am. We have to admit that we... All, no matter where we are in our spiritual life, we are still a broken mess. And we still need a Savior. We never outgrow our need for Jesus Christ. We never outgrow our need for the cross. We keep our eyes focused on the cross. But what we see ultimately, though, is this. Is that Paul is celebrating the gospel. Let's go back and look very briefly. Paul says this. I thank God because not only has he called me into his service... But he redeemed me. Paul goes up, go back and look in verse 13. He was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent. Some translations say an arrogant man. And so Paul doesn't really paint a very flattering picture of himself. And if you know Scripture well enough, and I think we, we, most of us here do, right? That we know that the story is really a whole lot worse than this, right? That Paul was, uh, was in, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 13, he says... How he persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. Not just stop it, but utterly destroy it. But Paul was so zealous for the law that he even violated the law and murdered people in order to protect the law, right? That Paul was the, the, the probably the number one persecutor of the church. He was a vile man. One commentator says this about Paul. Pre-conversion Paul. He says he was a callous, pious, self-righteous Bigoted murderer, hell bent on a full scale inquisition. He calls him Saul the Hunter, Saul the Man of Blood. But what do we see, though, in this passage of Scripture? Go and look um, at the tail end of verse 13. He was this, but what does God do? But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. 
And so the gospel changes Paul. Paul was this self-righteous, pious, religious man, but he still needed a savior. And God still extended mercy because Paul acted ignorantly in unbelief. Paul acted as, as if he didn't truly understand, and he didn't. And so his unbelief didn't disqualify him, but his, dis, his unbelief didn't also, also didn't earn him the love and favor of God. But Paul says this, that God still, over back, in, back in Romans, that while he was still a sinner, while he was still an enemy of God, Christ Jesus came and died in his place. So Paul is celebrating the gospel in his own life. And then he moves on in verse 15. He says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Not just Paul, not just churchy people who've, who've mixed it up a little bit and kind of misplaced their faith. But everybody. Back to those, those people in verses 9 through 11, or 9 and 10. Uh, the sexually immoral, the men who practice homosexuality, the slavery, slavery, perjurers, whatever else is contrary to some doctrine. The, the gospel is for those people. And so Paul rolls all this out into praise because Paul understands the gospel is big enough. The gospel is big enough for the church kid who has faith in themselves and faith in their, their behavior. Uh, the gospel is big enough for the person who's strung out on drugs in their house, the person who's running a meth lab in their house, the person who um, has murdered someone, the person who, whatever it is, the gospel is big enough for them. If we admit that we need a Savior, no matter who we are, no matter where we are in life, if we admit that we need a Savior, and we trust in what Jesus Christ accomplished in His life, death, and resurrection. And what does that lead us to? It leads us to celebrate. We sing songs on Sunday mornings. We sing them on Wednesday nights. Whatever we do, whatever we sing, our song, we sing because we are free, because we are alive, and we are no longer dead in our sins. We celebrate the work of Jesus Christ. The songs we sang this morning were perfect because it's all about Jesus, nothing but the blood, uh, all hell, Christ. I mean, just all these beautiful songs of faith where we are worshiping because of what Jesus has done for you and for me. And then Paul rolls out, and I love verse 17. He's, he's, he's just talking about the gospel, and he's just beginning to worship. I thank God. And then he just kind of... Can't, doesn't even know what to say anymore. You ever been there before? You're like saying something, you're just like, I just don't even know what to say anymore. And you're like, whatever. And then Paul just kind of says it in verse 17, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. It's something that Paul does uh, over and over. He does it in Romans uh, chapter uh, 11, verses 33 through 36. Romans 16, verses 26 and 27. This passage here, uh, Romans, uh, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, Ephesians 1, 3. Paul just kind of loses himself in worship. Let me just ask you this question, and this is a question I have to ask myself. How many times have you just lost it in worship? I mean, not like losing your mind. Uh, Miss Ann asked me earlier, Nick, uh, what day are you off? Uh, and I was like, every day, Miss Ann, I'm off in the head every day, right? Uh, I'm not talking about like losing, you're just going like crazy nuts. Or how many times have you just lost yourself in awe and wonder at the bigness and the love of God, the fact that the gospel is big enough for everybody? You are just overwhelmed by God. That's what Paul does. I love what John Calvin says about this, uh, this verse. He says, his enthusiasm breaks out into this exclamation since he could find no words to express his gratitude. These sudden outbursts of Paul's Come mainly when the vastness, the bigness of the subject overpowers him and makes him break off what he is saying. For what could be more wonderful than Paul's conversion? At the same time, he admonishes us all by his example that we should never think of the grace shown in God's calling without being lost in wondering admiration. This sublime praise of God's grace swallows up all the memory of his former life. How great a deep is the glory of God. As we think about who we once were before Christ, we can't help but just worship God and adore Him because of the great work that He's done. And now some of us are like, well, I wasn't that bad. You were still bound for hell. And God still saved you through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We celebrate the gospel. We guard the gospel. We protect the gospel. We focus on the gospel. And we celebrate it. And we celebrate the cause of it.
Because it's the gospel that, that sets us free to worship. And so have you lost yourself in wonder? Have you lost yourself in praise? Do we understand the depth of God's love? Does it lead us to marvel at His grace and His kindness? Does it lead us to worship and celebrate? Or are we coming to church and singing the songs because that's what we do on Sundays? So what is our response to all of this? The, the simple response is to say this. That we keep the gospel at the center of who we are individually and who we are corporately as a church. We guard the gospel and we celebrate the gospel. What does that look like? It looks like us, and I say this a lot to our students, and I know I've said it here a lot. We preach the gospel to ourselves constantly. What do I mean when I say that? That we always are reminding ourselves that we are in need of a Savior. But that God <coughs> sent a Savior. That, that gives us hope. It gives us peace. It gives us purpose. Martin Luther says, uh, once wrote this. He says that the gospel, but sometimes let's just get honest, we get tired of hearing about it. I know I, I say this, that statement all the time. Jesus lived the life that, he could, that we couldn't live and died the death that we should have died. I say that a lot. And our students just kind of like roll their eyes. And I've, I've dropped this one on them, and I have it taped inside of uh, one of my Bibles because I think it's fun. It says that the gospel was the principal article of all Christian doctrine, wherein the knowledge of all godliness consisted. Most necessary it is, therefore, that we should know this article, the gospel, well. We should teach it unto others, and this is my favorite part, and beat it into their heads continually. <laughs> we would beat it into our heads continually. That in and of ourselves, we were a broken, sinful mess. But while we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus died in our place. We guard that truth. We celebrate that truth. So we come to this time of invitations. We come to this time uh, to celebrate the Lord's Supper. We have every reason to celebrate. We have every reason to sing from a joyful heart.